It's either on the page or it's not on the page. This whole industry doesn't exist with people twiddling their thumbs, waiting for the right script to drop into their hands. I'm not sitting here for an hour waiting for you to tell me that. I need to know how I feel after I read it. If I feel like, what was I supposed to feel? Now you gotta go back to your drawing board. You say your main relationship is character A and character B, but your antagonist is character C. That says so much more than anything that's on the nose and obvious. Script is your heart and soul, the, the spine of the whole thing that you're gonna build off of, the foundation of everything that you're gonna lay on top of it. I try and read a script that's sent to me uh, as an audience first. Uh, so the first thing I'm looking at is, does it grab me? Do I care? Uh, is it a story that can, I feel emotional about, compelled by? You know, if it's a scary movie, am I scared? If it's a comedy, have I laughed? If it's emotional, have I, you know, gotten a lump in my throat? Um, I find that if I'm looking at it and dissecting it right from the start, I'm, uh, I'm not doing myself any favors and I'm not doing the script any favors. If I get to, I don't know, at some point and it hasn't done any of those things, I usually don't finish it. Um, but if I get to the end and I have felt those things, then I'll go back and do a second read as with my producer hat on. For one, like I said, emotional response, like I need to know how I feel after I read it. If I feel like, what was I supposed to feel? Now there's, you gotta go back to your drawing board. Um, so yes, uh, you have to know, the, the feeling. The feeling needs to be there. Some, something, some type of feeling at the end of it. The other thing is a true identity in what genre it is. And if not, it's okay, because I can, I can do that, I can help with that. But if the person doesn't know what genre they're in, it's not that you have to play by the rules, but you need to know the rules before you break them. And they're telling me, oh, I just made this awesome horror film. And I'm like, this is hilarious. Like, <laughs> I just watched it. And horror and comedy can inter intertwine, but it's like, you're gonna break a rule here. Let me make sure this is what you meant by this. Like, so I, it needs to have a really strong identity in its genre. And I don't care what the story is in terms of genre or, you know, people ask me like, do you, do you care? You know, do you care about a certain genre? And there, you, know, you seem to work in all different genres. I said, yeah, because I mean, to me, a good story transcends genre. It has nothing to do with genre. Genre is just sort of a set of conventions that allow people to identify what kind of movie it is, and and therefore whether they want to see it or not. But genre has nothing to do with whether you could tell a good story in any genre. And to me, working in different genres is part of the excitement of working in this business. Like, like that's why so many of us love being in this business, right? We don't go to the same office necessarily every day, and we can we're always pursuing something different. Is there some sort of character, some sort of protagonist? Can I identify with his journey in some way? I'm not even gonna use the word likable. I'm just gonna say, is it like a protagonist I can identify with in some way? I wanna follow him for some reason. Um, you know, is the, does he have goals? Does he have flaws? Is there an antagonist that's creating conflict with this guy, you know, or girl, or whatever the, the situation is? But is there, is there something I can get behind? Another thing it needs to have is somebody that's either, I can't say rooting for, but someone that a mass audience, like most people can connect with. Um, we're in a time where, you know, people are a little bit more open to different things. So I think that's, that's something that we're kind of having to like test the, the thermometer on like, where are we as a culture? Like what is now accepted or whatever? But you have a good idea just from living life and watching the news, like what people accept or scroll through social media. <laughs> you could get an idea of how they connect with things and, um, uh, how they, they see things. So if, if I have no one in that film that I see myself in, there's a problem. Because I can see myself in a lot of ways. I'm very versatile. I don't think I'm like this person that has to only see this and only see that. So if I don't see something that I can connect with, we're, we're missing something. So a connection to a character, doesn't have to be the main character, but a connection to a character in a way that brings a person in where like, okay, that could be my buddy. Yeah, I would say that too, or whatever. If it's so far off and like overly avant-garde or artsy, I just need to be told then, this is what that's supposed to be. And then, all right, great, you wanna make it? Here's a little teeny budget. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll help you get into some weird festivals. Like, you know, and they're like, no, I want this to be on every, you know, theater. And I'm like, well, we can't work together <laughs> because that's not gonna work. So yeah, as long as, as, long as it has um, someone to connect, connect to. I think, Screenwriters stand their best chance of really getting noticed uh, by knowing what the business needs.
So it's not coming in talking about how passionate you are about the script. It's talking and speaking in a way that answers to the needs of the production company, the producer, the studio, etc. Um, it's there are tried and tested genres that are just they they just nail what the business lives on. And if you if if a young writer wants to come into the business and really just get their emails answered, get their phone calls returned. It's being able to speak about their project and have it answer to those things. It's, it's going to be saying, I'm writing a, a family film about this. I'm writing a film about this. And it's a very quick point. It's not, uh, it's, you know, never coming of age stories. It's never dramas. It's, it's happier films. It's, it's the kinds of films you see on a red box machine. That's what Hollywood needs to stay in business. And so if you're coming to the table bringing uh, opportunities for Hollywood to continue staying in business, they're going to pay attention to you. Never at any point am I saying, don't write dramas, don't write uh, uh, comedies, don't write the coming of age story. If you have a fantastic idea for a movie, I think a writer should hold on to just hold on to it. Wait, like, get the commercial scripts out first, get a reputation of being a screenwriter who can deliver what the system needs, who can write quickly, who can write well, who can write within budget. Uh, and get a couple of actual paid gigs, and you'll get them. Uh, if you go in the opposite way saying, I know what Hollywood wants, they want this, they want these very uh, deep dramas, coming of age dramas, um, and forcing them to do that, uh, it's not, you're not gonna get noticed. But if you come and giving them what they want, which are like tween girl family films, or uh, Christmas movies with dogs, um, women in peril thrillers, these kinds of things, uh, Hollywood pays attention to you and once you are writing those and once you're getting noticed for that work then you have a collection of contacts and you can say I have an interesting idea could this work and then you can present those. What's the genre? Is it studio or independent? Um, who's your protagonist? What's their goal? Um, what's their flaw? Um, who's the main relationship? Like, what's driving um, the story? Um, who's your audience? Um, who's the antagonist? What's their goal and their flaw? Um, you know, what's the narrative question driving the film? So, like, every story, you should be able to sum it up in one main question. Like, so, like, die. If I was die hard, would be like, you know, will. The, you know, a New York cop trapped, you know, will this New York cop free his wife and hostages from some European terrorists who have them trapped in a skyscraper? Like, it's like one question, right? Like, so like, what's your narrative question driving this story? And what's your theme? And what's your thematic question? Like, what's, why are you telling this? The thematic question is like the question you pose to the audience. It could be a moral question, it could be, or something else, but some question you want them to think about, like, is family really just people you're related to, or is it something more? You know, it could be a thematic question. It's, it's not overtly stated in the story, but it's kind of like in the film subconscious. It's like what, you know, the film is really kind of about. And then your theme is how you answer that question by the end. That's your, the theme of your, your story. So, like, what are those things? Um, and I might even be missing a couple, I, but off the top of my head, those are like a lot of, and if you can't answer those questions, or if those questions don't make sense together, a lot of times there's the problems with the story. So for example, if you say your protagonist's goal is, my protagonist's goal is to grab the banana. And what's your antagonist's goal? To grab the orange. Well, they're in two different movies. They're never gonna intersect, there's no conflict. Great, your protagonist grabs the banana and your antagonist grabs the orange, movie's over. And that's a very simplistic example, but those are the kind of things, but on a deeper level we look at and we go, well, here, there's a few things that aren't making sense. You say your main relationship is character A and character B, but your antagonist is character C. They're not even in your main relationship that's moving the story forward. So why are they your, why are they your antagonist? Um, so the 12 questions from, and this is from amateur writers who have never had anything sold, what I you know, call development cases, people that you're, you have a belief in because they're talented and you're trying to get them there all the way up to you know, experienced screenwriters who have had you know, a half dozen pictures produced. Um, you know, the, they, the 12 questions is a great sort of reset. Okay, let me square away. Let me, you know, even if I've done this 100 times, every story is different and a lot of times you miss those, those important details. And once I think the 12 questions are, are making sense now and things are tying together, I'm like, oh, now see how the protagonist's goal ties into your theme? Okay, now everything starts, puzzle pieces start making sense. Then I say, okay, now, now let's work out a synopsis. Three or four paragraphs, you know, first act, second act, third act, whatever. 
just to, so we can say, okay, now let's make sure from just a broad story standpoint that all those questions are being addressed. And then from there, you can expand it to a full treatment and a scene outline and then, then start writing your script. Because like I explained to them, a lot easier to develop the story in a synopsis form or a treatment form than it is to keep rewriting the script when there's fundamental problems in it. You don't start building the building and go, oh, it's slanted. All right, let's start taking out some bricks and try to get straight. You work all of that out in the design phase and the blueprint phase. And so that's what I try to get them to do. And the, and the 12 questions is, is to me is like, okay, that's that beginning, that, that organic seed that we need to plant to make a, a healthy tree grow. I said, do you, do you have any scripts? I'm looking for something that features somebody with a disability that's simple to do. Small cast, simple locations. And that's when I read Carol of the Bells. And it met that criteria. I'm looking to do, you know, because like in Bakersfield, the community works with us. So locations you can get for free. Uh, they just open their doors to you there. Uh, so you're getting really good production value. We made a great deal with the hotels and the, the, the way we did it was each facility, uh, like Bakersfield is mine, I own, and the other ones are like franchises. So they sent two pros down and two students and then we used all our students that were ready to work to make this. And uh, so the criteria for that was limited locations, getting as much production value as you can with no money. And again, it's borrowing, stealing, whatever, but it's going in and, you know, going into someone's house and saying, hey, you know, we'd love to shoot here. We don't have any money. Would you let us use your house? And finding some beautiful locations and people working with you. So it's a good way to learn filmmaking, you know, to do without when you produce something. Because then later when you have money, it's like, oh, a filmmaker typically doesn't have just one project that he's interested in doing. In my case, I have a pretty important mandate. I'm only looking to do projects that are um, um, personally beneficial to the world. <laughs> and I'm not talking about pollution or something like that. I'm talking about a meaningful project that, that would uh, help people engage uh, and, and and see things, the filmmaking is so brilliant. That's the kind of films that I wanna make. Films that viscerally help you understand the world more and maybe make you more tolerant, maybe make you more perceptive. And you know, certainly filmmaking is one of the best vehicles um, um, other than speech. And to me, or a book, a filmmaker, you know, really has an opportunity to tell a story and with the, the belief, n not in a purposeful preaching, but the belief is you'll walk out and you'll have a perspective you might never have had. If I feel like the project's lacking, but I, can, but I feel like I can find my passion as we work on it, sometimes I look at it and I say, you know, but this guy, I really like working with him. I see how we can make this project better. And I know this person who's hiring me is open to the creative de development process. They're open to hearing out my ideas and letting me, whether it's an executive producer, whether it's a lot of times you get hired by the writer director and they have financing from somewhere but they don't want to do the day-to-day -day producing and so I'll come on as the main producer or I'll come on as a producer with them. As long as I, I believe that they're open to the creative process and that I can read that script and go, I can, f I can get passionate about this. I can find my passion as we work on it. I don't need to be passionate from the second I, I, I read it. Once I sign on the dotted line, you hire me and I'm involved in producing this picture, I'm 110% into the picture. It's not, you know, well, God, I'm not so sure you're not, you're not passionate about it at first. Once I put my name on the dotted line, that picture has my undivided attention and I'm gonna make it as great as I can be. But as long as I see the potential for it to be great and the potential for me to be able to put my fingerprints on it and be able to find my passion as we work on it, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll sign on to that. I'll sign on to that project as long as I see that potential. So my level of discernment's a little bit different than someone who's having to put up their own money and go out and chase, chase. But it allows me to work on a whole lot of other projects that I might not have otherwise even known about. And then, and also make a living doing it, which is nice when you can make a living doing what you love. If there's dialogue on a page that takes up half a page or almost the whole page, 
that's a telltale sign of, with exception, of course there are always exceptions, but that would be a sign that it's an amateur. If there's uh, pages in a script that are so dense that it looks like a novel, that would be another sign. If there's like page after page of, in, of very dense descriptions, that will wind up in, um, in the recycle bin or trash in the, your computer. <laughs> She's got 56 characters and he knew right away, bingo, that that was going to translate into a, uh, a portion of the budget that was disproportionate with what we had. And w what does that mean in English? The only affordable amount of characters we could have, in his opinion, was between 20 and 25 characters. And I know that sounds crazy, but any independent filmmaker is going to come in front of the same moment that I came in front of when you go, do you really need that character to walk in the door and go, hey, you got a phone call? that character is a SAG talking actor and that's going to cost you X amount of dollars and you put 40 more of those in the movie and you've made a movie that you're not going to be able to afford. And it's crazy and you know I know that you're interviewing me about creativity but if you can get this stuff off the table before you start talking creativity you, you'll have you know in my opinion a more controllable project. If in the script there are plot aspects or character behavior that's not clear to me or confusing or inconsistent, I'll just ask the question. And I always tell the writer that they never to feel compelled to agree with me. It's not a dictatorial thing, but it is for the purpose of, I feel I'm a pretty good barometer of what other, how other executives are, are going to respond to material. And if it's not clear to me, then there's a good chance that it might not be clear to someone else. So they don't have to, I never feel like I want to impose something to be done a certain way, but I will raise a question or I'll say, I feel that this dialogue, it doesn't feel authentic to me. It feels like there's an agenda, the writer has an agenda that you want the character to say this, but I think if we're really looking in the scene and a daughter is responding to her mother, how might she really respond? And I'll ask the writer to go back and kind of try and find the truth rather than the written agenda, if that makes sense. So. Well, you can immediately tell when a script has not been written by a professional, and obviously that, that's a big red flag. So if the script has like art on the title page or colored paper or is not in final draft form, um, you know, too much too much of a header or too much on the sides, and you know, okay, this person is either trying to get something to be shorter or longer by using the margins, which that's not playing fair. So, uh, so those are, but I would say red flags are things like, you know, not introducing your protagonist in the first 10 pages, not, you know, announcing what your film is, you know, in the first 15 pages. Um, you know, don't, don't wait until halfway through to tell me, oh, this movie's about this guy who wants to kill his mom. Okay, well, I'm not sitting here for an hour waiting for you to tell me that. So, um, uh, so I'm, I'm looking for the, the kind of structural and character problems um, that are pretty easy to spot. Um, you know, I'm not a big believer in the Robert McKee world of inciting incident and all of that, but there's value in what he has to say sort of philosophically, which is that there are some kind of foundational things you need to do in a screenplay that you, I don't, you know, unless you're doing experimental movies, which I'm not in that business. Uh, if you have a story to tell, there are certain, you know, parts of the roadmap you got to hit. And um, so if, you know, you hold back your protagonist until page 30, and that's just, not going to happen. There's no. You're not acting a movie. Ask, asking a movie star to show up a half hour into the movie. So, th those are the kinds of things I look for. And I just say, in terms of marketability, what gets agents' attention, uh, producers, studio networks is a is a, that you'll hear a strong voice. That there's something really fresh about a person has a point of view and that the character writing, the Quentin Tarantino is such a strong voice. Um, and I would say that Greta Gerwig, you know, has a strong voice. The truthfulness of that mother-daughter relationship, which wasn't 
pretty, um, you know, how they got in each other's faces and talked to each other, but it was truthful. And we know that they, they did love each each other and uh you know so touching towards the latter part of the movie when um the mother who was really kind of you know really tough with her daughter and the daughter didn't feel like she really loved her even liked her and then we saw that she was um trying to write a letter to her and crumbled it up like 30 times that's a that's another form of love versus this would be the boring way of doing it and not so truthful to the human experience would be well, you know I love you, maybe I'm hard on you, but maybe I'm doing it for your own good, or maybe I have my own issues, so I'm not really able to love that well, versus the simple, beautiful act that she was crumpling up letters because she wanted to find the right words and couldn't. That says so much more than anything that's on the nose and obvious. If I could say that there was a mistake that writers make, is it's not giving themselves the time or space to listen to how they add to a story or a situation. That they write what they think that the market wants, that they think that will sell without actually finding something that is that makes them excited about the telling and that has a personal resonance with them. So especially younger writers, they have to learn, it's cliche, but they have to learn how to find their voice and they have to value the fact that no matter what their age or experience level, they've got something of value to bring out. Um, and so the key thing is not to develop what other people have done, but to work on developing your voice. And I've never met a writer who isn't a reader. Um, the most significant writers I've ever worked with are very well-read individuals. And I love that um, because you have to get, you have to feed the well somehow. You have to get ideas and you, understand so much more about that internal space you want to live through when you're diving into it regularly with good books. It has to be relevant to the immediate culture. That doesn't mean it needs to be happening, but just relevant. For instance, I think some movies that were so good that didn't do well, it was like if they just waited a couple more years, it would have worked because we were moving to that, but this guy has a very strong opinion on it, this director or this writer or whatever. So if he's gonna come with his opinion, it's gonna kind of disconnect and people are not gonna spread it or uh, financiers are not gonna get down with it or um, you know, the distributor won't readily just open the door. They'll probably throw it on Netflix somewhere and bury it or whatever. It's because they just, it was such a good project, such a good story, but it just wasn't time for it yet. And I think for producers, they have to be very mindful of that um, it's not just keeping up with current events, it's kind of just talking to people um, and making sure that you're in a very diverse group of people. I think every producer, if you're only talking to your buddies from school, it's a problem. You need to talk to people from different backgrounds, different financial backgrounds, different races, different ethnicity, everything. You need to expand your horizons, travel. When you go to, even if you just travel a state over, go to like, don't go to Applebee's. I mean, I love you, Applebee's. <laughs> But like, eat Applebee's when you're home, but if you're in another place, go to like the little mom and pop and just kind of sit at a diner and talk to some people. Because I'm thinking, wow, this is such a great idea. I go to Montana, these people will never watch this. So it's okay if that's not, but I gotta keep that in mind. So if I'm not, I have no idea what's going on. I think like even with the political culture right now, people are like, I didn't know people thought like this. I'm like, I did. I toured all the country doing merchandise events. Like, I believe me, this is nothing new. But it's like, that's necessary. When you're the person, a producer, that is, is in a position to choose what stories are made or choose which stories you're going to push through or find financing for, choose the right ones for the time and tell the person if it's not ready, they might fight you on it, you might lose the project and they might do it anyway and then you'll see that they, you were right. <laughs> but if you communicate in a way the person can get down with it and then for writers, just know like while you're writing, let yourself run free but also be aware of what's happening around you and that doesn't mean your idea can't happen, you just might need to adjust it so it's like the little, you know, like sugar with the medicine type of thing, like a little bit of sugar. Just add a little sugar in it so it's a little bit more palatable for where we're at. That way we can spread it to the world and everyone can see your art. But if you're staying in this space and you're futuristic and you have this whole idea of where we're going, like, okay, let's, now we gotta add a more budget and make it futuristic then. It can't be now because we're not there yet or whatever. So yeah, being very mindful of what's happening, what the culture is and seeing when I'm reading that script, 
can someone accept this as truth right now? And you, there'll always be a couple no's, and you gotta know who those no's are. But if it's multi yeses, all right, we can now move forward. Is this affordable? Can we do this? Will there be a part in it for a star? Which is, you know, things that, things that are too ensemble are difficult to get made because you need a star role to get things ordered usually. So, you know, I'm looking, I have, then I took my other hat on. And then, then the producer hat goes, okay, what, where would I shoot this? How much is it gonna cost? Is there a star role? Where would, was there a network or studio that would buy this? Cause you don't wanna obviously chase something that there's no place to sell. And so then that's the second read. And is it a budget range that's reasonable? So a lot of people, they come to me and I get a lot of, how much would it cost to do this script? And I'm like, well, I'll tell you what, I'll answer that question if you can answer a question for me. How long is a piece of string? That's what I like to ask them. You can't just give me a script, how much does it cost to make that? Was Matt Damon in your movie? Great, well, your budget just went up by $10 million. I mean, I can make an argument to do this movie for a million bucks or 10 million bucks. Um, so really it's more like, well, how much can you raise? And then, you know, or, or how much do you have? Or, you know, if they, if they really don't have a good idea of this, who, who do you see in it? How wide do you see it being distributed? But I have to get an idea of sort of what range and how big they're seeing this in their head. And a lot of times I might read the, not a lot of times, but sometimes I might read the script and go, well, that's not going to, that's not going to happen on this. You know, you're not going to do Avatar on a $500,000 budget or whatever. The first thing I ask a person before we, I even read their script is, where do you see this going? And that kind of tells me, and it's funny because someone's always like, oh, I never thought of that. And I'm like, well, oh, no. you know, <laughs> you have to know where you're going to know how to do it. You have to know where you're going to know where to move and where to focus on and where to face. So if they don't know where this, if they wanted to go, that's going to make my job a little harder. Now I can read it and be like, ooh, this can do this, but at least let me know where you see it. And then when I'm reading it, I can kind of say, yeah, you got it or you don't. And are you fine with not having that? You would have this outcome. Are you good with that? Yeah, you know what I am, great. Or no, I'm not. Well, you're gonna have to go back to this, rewrite it, have much less location so we can get you a bigger star because this thing is not gonna sell. You know, like something like that. So um, yes, a, a good, I guess that would be direction, a good focus point of uh, where they want it to go. That helps me. When I look at a script, I'm thinking about a lot of different things. I'm thinking about all those things, um, specifically how, how they relate budget wise and fiscally, but also, you know, how that, <clears throat> you know, the creative and the fiscal will work together. So, you know, I, when I read the script, I'm thinking about story and I'm thinking about the arc of the characters and I'm thinking about the conflict and I'm thinking about why are we telling this story, but I'm also thinking about, okay, who, who would I get to play these? Who could I get to play these roles on this budget level? Like, what are some decent names? Who am I picturing in this? You know, I'm thinking about, and if, I mean, I'm presuming in this situation that the movie's real. That's not just a script. I'm not just reading it for fun, but it's like, okay, we're making this picture. Like this picture's funded, Mark, read the script. So I'm reading it and I'm like, okay, how are we gonna pull off that? We need that, this kind of grandiose house. Production design in the house, I'm looking at some of these things and I'm saying, you know, okay, we need this and we need, we need to dress the kid's room like this. Okay, who, you know, there's a very specific style. Do I know somebody who might be able to execute that style? It's very postmodern. Um, I've worked with a production designer that did this and wow, sound is such a big deal. Like, you know, so I'm thinking about all these, all of these things as I'm reading it as opposed to an actor's reading it. Yes, they're considering story. I think everybody with some sort of creative, you know, position is thinking about story um, to some degree. But the actor is going to be much more focused on their role and the arc of their role. And the cinematographer is going to be much more focused. They're going to be reading it and seeing something totally different. And they're going to say, oh, wow, okay, so you got a bunch of exterior night out here by the pool. Are we going to light the pool? How are we going to light it? Are we going to light the water? How are we going to? They're going to be looking at it that way. Or I see you got this shot that follows them through the house. And so they're going to want to talk to the director about how that. I'm thinking about all that stuff, but I'm thinking about like, okay, do we going to have the budget for those kind of lights? And creatively, if we can't pull something off, how are we going to be able to? you know, to make that, we can't pull that off with the budget or, or there's some other logistical circumstance that's gonna make that unreasonable. What are we gonna to have to change in the script to do that? And um, I'm also a line producer in a UPM, so I am, I'm breaking down the script and I am thinking about all of these things. I'm, okay, we need Steadicam to pull that off and we need, so I really do get down to that level of detail, but um, it, 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 to some degree, but um, I, I'm thinking about everything, um, you know, in one form or fashion as it relates to creative and fiscal and how those two things work together. And I think, I think probably a lot of other, um, I think writers are probably focused more on story and not a lot of them not necessarily on the logistics. And when I talk to them, I'm like, but how are we gonna pull this off? 
you know, like, oh yeah, well, so from a producer, uh, you know, producer's perspective, we're, ta- we're thinking more about execution. Uh, well, I think a lot of writers just, they just tell the story they want to tell and they don't necessarily think about how it will be done, which is fine. You're the writer, that's your job, just get the story out. But when it starts to become real and then we have to start approaching how we're going to do it, sometimes some things for logistical reasons have to, have to shift. Script dictates the budget. Um, script is your heart and soul, the, the spine of the whole thing that you're going to build off of, the foundation of everything that you're going to lay on top of it. Uh, and if you have money first and you're writing to the budget of that, uh, I think your creativity is, is paramount. Uh, and then dealing within the realities of you know, what's, what resources are available to you right and then you start talking about money and how you're going to fulfill that vision but if the vision is coming from a monetary me personally i've had more money on some of my other films didn't mean i did a better job producing in fact my third film mother's red dress i had more money than any of the other ones and uh it was my worst job producing why because i because i thought that by having more money to pay more money to each position and person that was working on it, I was just going to get better talent, and therefore I took my 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 better part of myself out of the equation. Just that it was going to be solved by money. Interesting. And and I learned a, a very valuable lesson on that. We got the film done, and everything was great, and it worked out fine. But um, I I saw dollars, and that I could get this kind of DP, and it didn't translate into success for the project. In fact, the person that I brought on. Once that DP left the project for another project in the middle of shooting, um, yeah, I brought in somebody else that had less equipment, less experience, and he did a fantastic job because his motivation was correct. So, so if, you, if you look at it from this standpoint, if you have money and you're going to pay people, right? I mean, we all want to get paid and we got to work to live and all that. But, but if that is the focus first, then I think that the, the, then you're doing the opposite. It's like, okay, we've got a marketing campaign we can do. Now let's find a script that fits, you know, the, the kind of content that we want to sell, as opposed to what comes from within. And do I like working with this person? Um, do I, you know, do I get a good, good sense? Because you're going to spend a year or more um, dealing with this person, depending on the scope of my duties. So. You know, sometimes I'm just literally brought on to, there's no development. I'm like, okay, the script's decent, you know, and I think I can influence it enough through the production process to make it a good, a good picture. And then at post, when I deliver the master drive or the DCP or whatever the final deliverable is, I'm done. I'm not involved in marketing or distribution. There are projects like that. It just depends on the term of the contract. So, but I would say at the least, I'm spending at least a year with this person. So, um, so yeah, well-written script, reasonable budget, and logistics, and um, and I like the person. Th- those are really my main criteria. It's important to remember that movies and TV shows cost an incredible amount of money to produce. And if there's nobody to watch it on the backside or to transact upon it on iTunes or at a movie theater, uh, then there's not much of a point in doing that. And there's, there's an even more expensive aspect of producing something, which is marketing it and getting it out in front of people so they know it exists, so that when they're interested in seeing it and ready to buy tickets or download it uh, f- behind a paywall and pay money for it, uh, they have the ability to do it and they're ready to do it right away. Um, so that's the financial end. So people in my position all, I mean, from where I'm working all the way up to top executives at studios, um, what those people, the end users, want to see is really, really important. And that's kind of where we're thinking because if the end users are interested in seeing it, then international countries would be interested in also having access to it. Uh, and they would be willing to invest money to have access to it early, which is where the whole pre sale game kind of comes into play. Um, or, you know, a TV channel here in the U.S., if they know their audience wants something very specific, they will kind of work to have that produced on their network, and they'll kind of work backwards uh, uh, 
you know, first finding out what kind of project it's got to be, the types of people who have to be in it, uh, and then working their way backwards to uh, get to the point of actually drafting, writing, and creating, and all that. So on, on the big scale, for these major, major productions at the studio level or the major network level, that's why they go for things like major franchises or very well-known books or very well-known media properties or doing remakes. There's already an audience there. They already kind of have an estimate of how it's going to be, you know, get from point A to point B. And that's where the business side of it really plays. It's what is it? How is it going to work? Where's the money coming from? And who's going to get paid what to make this whole process happen? That's got to all be figured out before you really hone in on the right script. Most screenwriting books approach it as you write a story and it evolves into a movie. And this whole industry doesn't exist with people twiddling their thumbs waiting for the right script to drop into their hands. It works the opposite direction, which is we know we need this type of content to be successful. We have certain channels or certain you know, platforms that we have to cater to with content. So that's the stuff we're going to be looking for as finished content or we'll go make it ourselves.